from the trails to the road to the track. If it's running, you'll find it right here on Trail Tales ARP. Run wild! Hello, everybody. Welcome to Season 4, Episode 12 of Trail Tales ARP. Today, I've got a very special guest with me coming all the way from Thailand. If you've ever heard of a honey badger, I've got one with me right now. And his name is Mike McLean. Mike, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks. I'm, I'm happy to be here and, and, and great to be talking to a, a fellow Canadian. That's right. So you are in Thailand, but you're born here in Canada. So we haven't had a, had a chance to talk yet. What province are you from? So I'm born in Alberta in a small town called Barhead, about an hour and a half north of Edmonton. Okay, awesome. So and so you grew up there and everything, and then you've ended up in Thailand. How did that happen? Yeah, so so I grew up grew up there. had had never really traveled much. I mean, when you grow up in Canada, you never really need to leave. There's so much in your backyard that you you know you don't travel much and and didn't travel the world. And then at uh, 22 years old, I kind of left and went on a working adventure. So I started in, in West Africa, um, went over to Nigeria and spent a few years in, in West Africa working. Um, and then I went to Southeast Asia and, and worked Malaysia, Vietnam. Um, and that's where I came to, to Thailand and then had kind of met my wife when I was working over here, um, who was my girlfriend at the time. And then, yeah. then we just kind of moved around and continued working around the world basically. Oh, wow. um, so we decided to, yeah, get, get serious and then got married and decided, you know, we need to pick a spot and settle down, you know, to raise a family. And we thought, well, what, what better than, than Thailand? Awesome. So, so you've had a pretty, pretty exciting life up until this point, eh? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Lo lots of travel, lots of seeing the world. So uh, no regrets for sure. Oh, that's really awesome, Mike. So when's the last time you've been, you were back in Canada? So we lived in uh, Houston for four years um, okay. with work. Um, so that was from 2013 to 2017. So, so we, we visited home quite frequently there, you know, direct flights, Houston, Edmonton, and, and we were back quite a bit. Okay. Um, and then we, we went back once in 2018, and then we're obviously planning to go this year. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Tra traveling is kind of on hiatus right now so so that trip didn't pan out but we'll definitely plan to get back I mean we um, for me I miss I miss the this time of year I miss the snow I miss getting ready for Christmas and, and everything else that's probably the biggest thing I miss aside from family yeah for sure the uh it's it's weird to even for me to picture Christmas without snow or cold or anything I haven't had that yet you know so we yeah haven't had, we haven't had uh, snow in a few days but we've got uh you know about half a foot out there right now so it's not too bad. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. So, Mike, um, you just came off a big win. You just ran the UTMB-sanctioned uh, 120K ultra run in Phuket. And, yep. you, like, you finished first. Yeah. Like, yeah. That's, so th That's crazy. Yeah, it was awesome. So the race was up in, in Doi Intanon, which is, is okay. kind of the northern part of Thailand. And, and that's where the, if you want to say mountains, I mean, I, I use that term kind of a little more liberally since I haven't lived in Canada you know what we call a big hill most other countries call a mountain yeah, um, yeah. so you know that that's where the bigger mountains and the bigger you know things are there so it, it was an amazing trail race yeah and, and a UTMB sanctioned race as well so it was really well put on um, unfortunately a lot of international athletes couldn't get here just because of, of the sanctions and quarantines um, yeah. and everything else but it was still a really good race I mean you had the top runners in, in Thailand competing um, and it was just one of those races for me that, that just clicked. I would, I would almost call it my, my unicorn race. You know, I oh, never really? really had, never had those low moments, just felt great the whole time, had a smile on the whole time. Um, and never really had to push my limits too much. You know, I, I took off from the start line and that was it. I, I seen one other runner at the second aid station. He came in as, as I was going out and then I never seen a, another runner um, again. And oh, wow. Did you get lonely so being me, by yourself? Um, it doesn't. It doesn't. I like that. So for me, that's what I like in an ultra. I mean, that's what really draws me to it. I like being in my own headspace and, and you find out really cool things about yourself when you're in that headspace. Yeah. Um, and, and I just quite in, enjoy it. So, um, 
I just lived in the moment and, and really enjoyed that and, and never realized, you know, how, how well I was running or how good things were going. Um, but I always had that subconscious thing going in the back of my head. You know, am I moving quick enough? Is someone catching me? I'm going at this pace. If they're going at that pace, it's going to take them X amount of time to catch me. So that was pretty neat because that kind of kept me, you know, in the moment again and not really focusing on, you know, am I sore? Am I hungry? Am I tired? It was really all about being in the moment of, of racing. Yeah. Um, With that thought process going on, you know, wondering, you know, how long it's going to take for somebody to catch you. Do you find, do you think that you kind of push yourself a little bit harder than you would have, or did you kind of take it easy? Like what was your strategy there? So I, I, I didn't really push myself because my race strategy going in and what I had decided with my coaches is we're going into this race to have fun and run my race. Okay. So I went out, I went out at my comfortable pace and, and I just basically kept that through the whole race. Okay. I, I pushed a little bit on the big uphill section um, after I had seen someone at the aid station. I'm like, okay, he's coming in as I'm going out. So maybe I need to put it down a little bit more. Um, and I love climbing. So for me, that's, that's where I really do my best work is, is up hills. Um, so there was a really long section of, of four or five kilometers where we, we gained about 1400 meters of elevation. Um, so I just laid it down there and nice. then looking back. And if you look at the splits between the aid stations, that's where I, I put a lot of time on, um, ended up finishing the race and it was three hours ahead of second place. Oh, wow, man. That's, that's um, a big lead. That's a but, big lead. But I never knew that in the race. Yeah. So that was the really neat thing. I never knew that. So I never really let off the gas until about kilometer 80. I kind of pulled back a little bit and I said, you know what, let's just slow down a little bit, keep going at a, at a decent, comfortable pace. But knowing in my mind that if I slow down a little bit, I'm going to recover, I'm going to recuperate somewhat. And if someone does catch me, great, that's awesome. Let's have a drag race finish. That would be sure. that would have been fun for me. Yeah. So um, it never ended up happening, but that was my mindset. So my mindset was never, I need to keep pushing, pushing, pushing in case someone catches me. My mindset was let's be in the best physical shape I can be after running 100, 110 K um, yeah. to have a race to the finish. If someone does catch me, cause I knew if someone did catch me, they'd had to be pushing pretty hard. Yeah, um, for sure. But it's, it's good to have a little bit in the tank just in case, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Now, have you found that you, you always enjoyed the climbs, like the verticals, or is that something you just kind of worked at and realized you were good at? Cause I know for myself when I'm running, um, I mean, I don't have any mountains here in Ontario. We've got, you know, rolling terrain and stuff like that. Yeah. There's some, there's some good hills and stuff, but I always feel like I like going uphill as well, a little bit more. It feels like there's something more to bite onto, right? I yeah. For myself. So I like it. I just, but what about yourself? Is it something you work towards or just natural? It, it's natural. That's probably, yeah, for me. And, and, and okay, I'm working on getting better at it, but sure. I've always liked it. I've always enjoyed it. I've always felt really comfortable with it. I think that may be my body structure as well. You know, I'm a bigger guy for an ultra runner. Um, and, and growing up in Canada, I played hockey my whole life. Yeah. So I, I had the strong quads and the strong glutes and the strong hamstrings and the strong calves, which lead you to be a good climber. Yeah, you know, and, and then I always enjoyed hiking and being in the mountains and, and doing stuff like that. So so when I get to the climbs, it, it's just something I really enjoy doing. Yeah, you're kind of built for it, like you said. So yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, that's pretty awesome, man. That's pretty cool. So um, I want to ask you about your nickname, the honey badger. Now I looked up yeah. some, some of the characteristics of a honey badger real quick. So honey badger is known to be fearless, thick skinned, uh, resourceful, unwavering and ferocious. Yes. And there was one on there that didn't, uh, it didn't make the list, but I can see it from you. And apparently they have a really big smile. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. so yeah, it, it, it's a pretty cool story and, and it, it comes from running as well. So in, in two, and it hasn't been with me for very long. So it's only been a couple of years where I've really been the, the honey badger and known in kind of the ultra running community okay. as the honey badger. So in, in 2018, I was running a four deserts, um, one of the four desert series race put on by racing the planet. Yes. Um, and it was 250 kilometers across the Namib desert in, in Namibia. Um, and, and for me, the race was going good. But the cool thing about those races is you travel with a whole group of people um, yeah. and you go from kind of campsite to campsite and then you stay in a tent with a group of seven people and then you run anywhere between 40 and 80 kilometers a day for 
six, seven days. Um, so we were out, it was day three in the race and I was doing pretty well. Um, I was in fifth place overall and it was just, I was just having fun and just loving it and, and going through that. But every day after I finished the race, I wasn't like some of the other top competitors. They would kind of retire to their tent and put their feet up and this and that. I would come to the finish line. I would bang the drums. I would run out and run in with other runners, you know, kind of pace them across the finish line, keep people going um, like that. And, yeah. and that night we were sitting in our tent talking about this. And then someone said, well, you just don't give a shit. And then someone said, the honey badger doesn't either. <laughs> and, and that's where it started from that YouTube video, right? Yeah, yeah. And then the more, the more everybody thought about it and thought all these characteristics of a honey badger really kind of fit my personality. I was resilient and then thick skinned, always wore the big smile and, and really didn't care much about myself. It was always getting out to help others or being the first one out of the tent, cleaning the tent, you know, and, and then go out and smash a run. But as soon as everybody else was getting in, I was helping make their food, make their beds and, and everything else. So it was just, it was really cool. It was given to me by a good friend, you know, Leon Clarence, and, and he's an ultra runner as well. And we just bonded over that. And pretty soon it was what everybody called me. Um, nobody knew me by Mike in the race anymore. And then the really neat part was when the local Namibians that were with us helping with camp and everything else were like, yeah, that fits you. That's what animal you are. And I just got goosebumps when I heard that. So that was, that was pretty cool. And then that's kind of stuck with me ever since. And that's been my traits is I'm pretty resilient and then thick skinned and I just don't let things bother me. And that's a, that's a wild story. I like it. And I bet, uh, I bet those guys love when you're at the race with them, then they know they're going to get some extra help and everything. Eh? Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and j just being there, I mean, I get quite a few people saying, okay, if you're running this race, I'm running it for sure. Let, let's do it, you know, and, and that's cool. To me, that's that's what ultra running is about. It's about the, the family mentality and just this camaraderie that you have with, you know, people you didn't even know before you stepped to the starting line. And by the time you finish the race, you're, you're lifelong friends just because of this amazing physical, mental and emotional journey you went through together. You just have this bond. Oh yeah. How could you not, how could you not have a bond after going through something like that with other people, you know? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, that, that's really crazy, Mike. Um, so, you know, I've only done one ultra in my life up until this point and it was kind of a thing I just want to do. It wasn't an actual race, right? Last November, I yep. went out with my buddy and uh, we're like, let's just go and run a 50 K. Let's just start there. Yep. Right. So I had no training under my, under my belt. It was just, you know, my regular running here and there like, ah, we'll just go do it. So we set ourselves up for success, I think, and we stopped. It was like a 10K loop, right? We just did like five loops and yep. whatever, stopped at our car each time and took some nutrition in. And I was hurting near the end, but I accomplished it and it was, it was finished. And, you know, it was, it was a hard thing to do. So I think just completing an ultra in and of itself is, is a big accomplishment. But, you know, to win them is, is something even more rare. So, yep. like, what, what kind of training are you putting yourself through to kind of get to that condition where you can actually like, you know, not only run an ultra, but, but place high in them. Yeah. So for, for me, there was, I mean, in, in about, so I haven't been running ultras that long. I only started in, in 2016 um, okay. running, running wow. ultras. And so 16 and 17 was just really falling in love with the sport and, and enjoying it and running in cool places. And I was really had the, completing mentality i'm out there to complete the race and then Absolutely. have some fun um and and then kind of seven 17 into 18 it kind of switched over for me and i thought hey I'm, I'm doing pretty well at this so let's get a little more serious about it and then let's put on the the competing hat still having fun still smiling but let's put some more serious thought into this that's when i got you know a trail coach and, and we started really working seriously on, on training um, and, and for me, that was where the big difference was, you know, to complete an ultra. Yes, you need to train for it. Yes, you need to get out and run. You, mm -hmm. you need to put in some mileage. Um, but if you have the mental mindset, most people can, can get through with, with, you know, a decent amount of training can get through a 50K um, race. And, and then a little bit more training, a little bit more weekly mileage for an extended amount of weeks, you can get through a 100K race. Um, but the, the big step is when you want to come to compete in those races, then you find you need to, to really do specific training. So, you know, I just don't go out and run high mileage. I focus on, on quality training. 
Mm-hmm. So I don't want to go out and just run, you know, a hundred K a week at the same pace for six weeks. You know, right. to me that, that that's not going to accomplish what I want. I do, you know, um, for me, so Monday is strength training day. Um, I, I'm a firm believer still in strength training and, me too. and yep. I used to do, I used to do CrossFit a lot, um, before I got into ultra running. So I still like that aspect yep. of things. Okay. I don't want to lift as heavy and be able to lift as heavy and, and go as much, but I still do the CrossFit once a week um, just because I like that. Sorry, man. I think my alarm's going off. This is like a big blunder. Hold on one sec. <laughs> no worries. No worries. All right. I owe you a beer, buddy. <laughs> Got it. No worries. No worries. Yeah. So so the CrossFit, I, I do that on, on Mondays. Um, and then Tuesdays for me is always a, a bigger day. So I do track and trails. Okay. Um, so I normally do a track session in the morning where I'm focusing on speed and, and speed work and really focusing in on, on dialing in my form and, and getting, you know, those quick twitch fibers and, and all that Absolutely. stuff engaged and going. And then I do a, a Tuesday trail run as well. Um, so anywhere between 10 and 15 K just at a, a, a nice, easy pace. Um, and, and with a few quicker sections in there, just to kind of cement home some of the stuff you did you know, on the track. Sure. sure. Um, and then Wednesday, Wednesday's trails, I get out and run on the trails um, for prescribed either time or distance, just depending on where I am in my build. Um, Thursdays is always Hills Day. So it's, okay. it's hill reps after hill reps after hill reps. Um, and then Fri- Friday's off day. Friday's just kind of rest, recovery, body maintenance, eat like a maniac. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, go for a massage, get in the pool, do, do some active recovery. Yeah. cycle a little bit and, and then saturday and sunday are always um long run days um okay. so saturday i'll do my longest run generally and and that just depends how long that is where i am in my training build it can be anywhere from 20 to 45 k okay um and and then on sunday i will generally run between 75 and 80 percent of the distance i did on saturday okay so and, and try and keep generally the same pace. Same pace. So, so yeah. it's a little less distance, but pretty close to the same pace. Yeah. So two kind of back to back long runs, just putting that mileage on. Correct. Correct. Getting yeah. that mileage on and just cementing it in. And then, you know, you get that little bit of fatigue from Saturday. So, but you're trying to keep going on Sunday, but you know, you got a little shorter bit. And, yeah. and then, you know, Monday's just strength training day. I say just, but Monday's yeah. strength training day. So you're not as worried about burning out. Yeah. Now, I, I'm a firm believer in strength training too. I think it's so important. And I think it's something that I think a lot of us runners, whether you're, you know, running ultras or even just, you know, road races or track maybe track runners do a little bit more, but um, I think it's just something that's just um, undervalued, you know? I completely agree. Um, I I think strength training to me is, is more important than just putting on tons of mileage at a consistent pace, because especially in ultras and trail running, you know, on, on a road is, is a little bit different. I still think you need to strength train, but on a road, it's generally flat. The terrain yeah. smooth. You can almost put your feet in autopilot. Um, but when you get on a trail, you're you're moving different ways. You're engaging different muscles that you don't any other time. And, and generally, if you DNF because of a strain, a sprain, something else, it'll be one of those small muscles. You know, you'll you'll never generally go out because you know your calves or your quads. It, it'll yeah. be you know IT bands, hip flexors, yeah, exactly. things that you don't look after and, and yeah. train generally. Yeah. Um, and, and that for me has made the biggest difference, I think, is, is focusing on some of that strength training. I just find that I'm, I'm more comfortable and confident as well, because those parts of your body aren't hurting later on in the race. You're not sore. So you're keeping better form. You feel comfortable running downhills more. Yeah. Now, when you are doing your strength training sessions, with that being said, are you focusing on like your hip flexors and your piriformis and all those other muscles in the glutes? Or are you doing more like upper body stuff to give your legs a break or? How do you approach that? So I, I kind of balance it. I mean, okay. I, I do do some upper body work, but generally, um, so I go to a CrossFit gym and, and do a group workout, but nice. Monday's workout is, is a great workout that they do every Monday. You know, they call it the Punisher um, <laughs> and it, in, it incorporates a few things. So it's, it's like a high intensity interval training workout, but then there's always something they call the punishment, which always incorporates a little bit of running into it as well. So you're doing all of these exercises, which, 
you know, focus on upper body, lower body. It's a very balanced workout. Um, but then after one set, you go for a run here or there. Um, and, and which is really good because you're engaging also your running muscles. Yeah. And bet- for me, I just found it fit so well that I just, yeah. Yeah. Can't go without it on Monday. Yeah. I bet like during the running phase, everybody's moaning and groaning. You're like, finally a break. <laughs> oh yeah. For me, it's like, bring on the run. Everybody's like, I was like, we've got to run. I'm like, yeah, you beauty, bring on the run. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's the honey badger coming out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh man. Exactly. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, so you've only been running ultra since, uh, 2016. Um, what, what was your running life like before you got into ultras? And then second part to that is, is how did you discover ultras? So for me, my running life before ultras was, I, it was more pain than pleasure. Um, and, and I'll kind of elaborate on that growing up, you know, playing hockey. Yeah. Running was used as punishment. Yeah. I've right? seen those you, t-shirts you a, too. Exactly. You, you yeah. had a bad practice. You had a bad game. What did you do? You ran laps or ran stairs at the arena until you physically couldn't move anymore or your head was in the trash can. Yeah. And then the coach was happy. He's like, okay, you've learned your lesson. Now let's go out and have a practice. So to me, that's what I kind of associated running with. Running yeah. was was not something fun. Running was, was punishment. Um, and I kind of dabbled in a little bit of running in, in high school, but nothing, nothing, big and, and that's not my background so ice hockey um, and then I was doing CrossFit and Muay Thai when I was here in Thailand so running then was used as just conditioning to get that cardio up so that you could go the distance of a CrossFit you know competition or workout or go the distance in, in a Muay Thai um, yeah. match but it wasn't until I went to Houston that I really fell into running and, and ultra running um, so when we were there, I kind of fell into the Texas lifestyle, um, was eating big portions, drinking yeah. lots of beer and, and gained lots of weight and was really unhappy with just everything, yeah. um, how I looked in the morning, how I had no energy and everything else. Um, luckily enough, I was working in an office with a couple of, of ultra runners who, who were pretty well, um, pretty good runners. One was the, the top um, runner in Texas for women. Um, so, and that they became good friends and they just challenged me one, one weekend. They said, Hey, in a couple of months time, there's a 50 K trail race. You want to come run it with us. And it was a 12 and a half K loop that you did four times around kind of a ranch in Texas. Um, and I said, sure, why not? It's only 50 K, you know, me not knowing. Yeah. So then I started to, to train for it a little bit, just running on the roads and running around the house and, and in a few of the parks in Texas. Um, yep. Went to that event, finished the event, um, couldn't walk for four or five days because I was <laughs> you know, not in shape, not ready for it at all, but absolutely just fell in love with the sport and the atmosphere around it. It was just a big party and everybody was there having fun. And on a loop race, you're getting passed by the leaders all the time and they're cheering you on and, and everybody's encouraging you. You can do it. You got this, keep yeah. going. And, and, and from then on, it was just this extreme love of, of the ultra running and the ultra running community. Um, so then I just kept going and, and going and going. And then, you know, that's yeah, kind of the start to my ultra story. Oh, that's awesome, man. So, you know, that, uh, that beginning doesn't sound too, uh, unfamiliar, you know, you kind of get, you're out of shape. You don't like the way you are. You don't feel yourself. Yep. I was like that when I started running too, it's just, I, I didn't feel like who I, I was supposed to be, who I was, you know, like yep. I've always been active growing up and stuff. And then, you know, life catches up to you and you overeat and you don't move. And it's just like, what yep. happened? <laughs> you yeah, know? for sure. For sure. And then, and then you get running and, and that's the thing about ultras and, and you, you really discover yourself when, when you go longer in these runs. And that yeah. for me was the really cool part. The longer I started to run um, was, was the more you discovered about yourself because, because you're in your own headspace for a long time, you yeah. know, and a lot of ultras, especially after the first 10 or 15 kilometers, if you're running, for example, a hundred K event, then you're by yourself for 70, 80 K. You know, yeah. unless you're running one of these really big races with two, 3,000 people. But th- those aren't every weekend kind of things. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, 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 it's such a, um, a crazy experience, you know, and, and it does become a mind over matter at some point, right? 
like when you were yeah definitely and and that that's where you know that's where you make or break in an ultra it's it's that mental strength and that mental fortitude yeah Um, and i think for me that translates well into every aspect of your life if you have that mental fortitude and overcome things in an ultra then you're better set up for for family life for work life for business you know you just have that mental strength to deal with things and and they don't become a big problem because you can't freak out at a little problem in an ultra otherwise you'll just melt down and you'll stop at the next aid station sit down and never get up again yeah you know yeah bring on a bus bring on a car take me home i'm out of here yeah that's Um, it if you just deal with deal with it as it comes and say okay well okay it's a problem but it's not that big i'll just keep going and and away you go yeah no it's it's, and you can't can't really train for that per se you just got to kind of experience it and then, yep. and then deal with it as it comes to, you know, kind of go, kind of go with the flow. Yeah. So, really, so right? that is the hardest aspect to train personally. Um, yeah. I find that the best way to, you know, if you want to experience or kind of discuss some of that is to talk to people that have ran ultras, yeah. you know, ask them questions about it, you know, ask them, what do they have tips and tricks to kind of deal with some of that stuff. Yeah. Um, and that's where you gain this valuable experience. And that's, what's cool about the ultra running community. Nobody's secretive about that stuff. Nobody's keeping their magic formula to themselves that they're, they're yeah. willing to share just about everything with you to help you become a better person, a better runner. Yeah. Yeah. And that, and that's, that's so great. And that's, I think one of the, the big attractions to the sport itself, right. It's just the yep. camaraderie you have with everybody there. Everybody's kind of like-minded and stuff and, yep. and, and sure. being out in nature for that long. I mean, you can't really beat it, you know? No, you can't. There, yeah. There's nothing to. <laughs> I know. There's a. It's it's funny when I did that 50k last November. We did it on Remembrance Day on November 11th, and it was funny. It started off as like a fall day, and then by the time we yeah. were done, it was like a full-on snowstorm. Eh, like couldn't even see the ground anymore, <laughs> and the wind was blowing. We were like covered. Our eyelashes were frozen and stuff. But I know, like that mental thing came to me because we were you know at 45, 46, 47 kilometers. I'm like we're almost done, but my hip flexors were sore. You yeah. know, and I was just tired and I had nothing left. And my buddy, Dave, he's one of the co-hosts. He's not here with me tonight, but he, uh, he got me through it, man. Like, you know, he was just pushing me and, and cracking the whip yep. and it and it really did help, you know, cause I had got to that point where I was like, man, I can't do this anymore. And I was like, he's going to walk a bit. And he's like, no, keep going, keep going. So I really credit him to helping me get through that last little bit. It was hard. Awesome. Yeah. yeah that, that's cool. Yeah. That's so, um, Let's see here. We got to talk about uh, we got to talk about the great Eric Boom. <laughs> He's yes. the guy that connected us together. So yeah, for sure. Now you said you do track work and everything, and you work on speed yep. stuff like that. Is is Eric the guy you go to for that? So definitely, Eric Eric's the guy I go to for that. Um, and I haven't been working with Eric that long, so I started working with him just before the Thailand um, by UTMB race. Oh wow! And, okay. Um, I started working with him for that because I actually was was injured. Um, so I ran a race in the beginning of September um, okay. and at kilometer 17, um, I just kind of had a misstep, wasn't paying attention and put my mind into autopilot. And I really, really badly sprained my ankle, um, oh. thought it was broke, spent a few hours at the hospital making sure it wasn't um, yeah. and it wasn't. But that was only seven weeks before the UTMB race. Um, oh, wow. So I was pretty worried about, you know, conditioning and everything else. Um but then I started talking to, to my trail running coach and then we said, well, let's go back to basics. Let's work on strength constraining. Let's work on conditioning. And then I started to analyze my running a little bit because I couldn't get out and run. So I right. just had lots of time to sit there and think about it. And I thought, well, why don't I start looking at my form and my technique? If I'm not going to be able to push as hard as I want on this ankle, well, then I need to do it effortlessly or I need to do it, you know, with, with less so I have more in the tank. So that's when really? I kind of started working with Eric um, as, a, as a running thing. I, I knew Eric before that, um, okay. which is a pretty cool story. So it's actually, it was mine and Eric's daughters that introduced us to each other. Oh, wow. Um, so we came back to, so my wife and family and I moved back to Thailand in March um, when, when all the COVID stuff was happening because we were living in Brunei at the time. Okay. Um, and we decided, you know, let's go back to Thailand. We've, we've got a house there. It's a little bit nicer um, to have some family and support network. And then we felt just would feel more comfortable there. Um, so we came back here, enrolled the kids back in school, and then everything locked down. And, and they started the online schooling um, via, you know, Skype and then Meet and yeah. Google Classrooms. And, that. And, and my daughter really got along. So she was four. She really got along with this other girl named Senna. 
and and they would have these after class conversations on on Meet and Zoom and, and just really connected. Um, and and then that went on through the whole lockdown and everything. And then everything opened back up. The school started back up, and we took our kids to school on the first day um, when they opened up and I wore one of my running t-shirts as I normally do, you know, and, and got there. And lo and behold, Eric was wearing a t-shirt he had got from a hundred K race. <laughs> and when we took our kids into class, his daughter said, Hey daddy, look, he's wearing the same shirt you are. And <laughs> that's how Eric and I met. And we just started talking and just had this instant connection through running. Um, and we spent a lot of time talking. He had explained to me what he did and I kind of explained to him the running stuff. And then after I had the injury, I just instantly thought of Eric, Hey, why don't I work on some of my form and, and look at some of that. Um, I yeah. credit some of that work with my recovery because we were doing form drills and, and we were doing this form training at really slow speeds, but it was all the running mechanics you needed but it wasn't putting all of this pressure on my leg right? because I wasn't running at any pace. Um, and yeah, so it just went really well with the, the recovery and, and everything into UTMB and lo and behold, it did really well in the race. Um, and, you know, from there on now it's let, let's get faster. Yeah. And that, that my focus now is, is let's get faster. Sky's the limit now, eh? exactly so and and, yeah. and i'm really starting to enjoy the track workouts i never really liked running on the roads or you know doing any of that so but now the track yeah. workouts are, are pretty fun it, it's really neat to go that fast yeah and know that the human body can actually go this quick that's cool yeah and it's it's such a great kind of shock to your system if you will because you're like you alluded to earlier you're activating those fast twitch muscle fibers you're putting yep. that different load on your body, right? And and the adaptations you're going to get from there, you know, I've been reading a lot of research and stuff on how like that interval type hit training will actually yep. give you those same um, aerobic benefits that you would get from low, you know, uh, low yep. long distance running, right? Yep. Low, low intensity. So it's really good. I've been spending a lot of time at the track. Now I know you saw that picture of that gravel track. Yeah, yeah. Down. It's uh, it's magic. covered it's covered in <laughs> snow. And I was out there yesterday with a buddy of mine. Going, We're going to go run on the track, and uh, we it was kind of like running in sand. But the funny thing is, because I've been doing track sessions now in the past two weeks, my my overall average time for my ten reps on the two hundred meters in the snow was faster by 2.6 seconds in my average when it was gravel before the snow hit. Yeah. That's just, it's just that's just the training, right? And the improvements I'm getting. Yeah. So it's no, and, and that's right. where I'm getting on the track as well. I'm, I'm running at paces now that are comfortable to me where six, eight weeks ago, they were almost excruciating. Yeah. You know, you and, could finish them, but by the time you were done, it was hands on the legs and you were going. <gasps> yeah. <laughs> And now I'm comfortably running those, which, which is really cool just to see that coming too. So absolutely for 2021. And, and when, when you couple that in with like the form focused running, yep. it's, it's just, it's, it's a huge advantage that you have, right? It, it definitely is. And then there's some, some knock on benefits to that, that, you know, Eric never realized and I never realized when we started this was, was, it was all focused on, on road running and, and getting the form and that but I've really noticed improvements going uphill as well. Really? Um, be, because of the, the form focus and then some of the stuff, when you run quickly on a track, you need to have some of those exact same mechanics to run really well and efficiently uphill. You know, you need yes. to be leaning forward from your ankles. You need to be sweeping and pulling from your feet and you just need to have that really quick repetitive step. Um, yeah. and, and it's all about cadence going uphill and then, then heart rate management. So yeah. that has been a really cool, intangible benefit. So I'm finding that I'm, I'm going up hills quicker able to keep it longer and feeling less gassed when I get, you know, to the top and to yeah. the downhill. So, so for me, that's a, a great, you know, unplanned benefit of yeah. the form and the track work. Yeah. And especially when you're doing like big elevations, that's so important to have. Right. And you actually read my mind. Cause that was going to be my next question was how do you find the work you've done with Eric? How is that translated into running on the trails, but you just answered it yeah. right there. So. Yeah, so so it, it it does it does in the uphill and it also does in in the downhill as well. You know, down downhill running's a, a very different beast as well, and then lots of people hate it because it doesn't feel comfortable when yeah, you're truly I, I running downhill downhill properly. You're 
leaning forward at your ankles. You know, you're not sitting on your haunches. You're not like you're doing squats in a chair. And then that's the way I used to run downhill. I used to finish a race and it felt like I had done 10,000 reps of squats, you know, just burning in the backs of your legs. And I couldn't figure it out why until Eric and I did some running. He says, well, when you're running downhill, you're sitting in a chair. He said, that's yeah. the best way to put it. And, and now I've kind of changed. Okay, you need to lean forward and you get up higher and you just go for it. It feels unnatural. You have to practice it a lot. Yeah. Um, but, you know, if you can get that, then it's, yeah, it's, it's pure gold. Oh, yeah. For me, just thinking about leaning forward, going down a hill, I just, I just, I can feel the face plant coming. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I mean, there'll be those odd times and those yeah. odd moments. And, and but you, you got to get over that, right? Crashes, but it, exactly. You just got to get over it. And, and eventually, the more you practice, the more it becomes automatic. And then I think that's the biggest thing with downhilling yeah. is, is you, you need to have the form, but then you just need to build that confidence. Yeah. And that can only be done by repetition. Exactly. Yeah. And, and the thing is too, with the training and stuff you're talking about, you know, whether it's training on the track or doing your long runs, it, you really do kind of cheat yourself if you're not putting in a good effort. Eh? It's like, I was talking yep. about that with yep. my buddy, like you gotta, you gotta put in that effort. If you're, if you're running the running, you know, the short intervals or whatever, you really got to push yourself, make yourself uncomfortable and give it all you can because you're spending the time there anyways. And you want to, you're working for improvements. So you got to really just kind of push yourself. Otherwise you're not, you're not, you're doing yourself as this service, right? Exactly. That that's why I kind of have my training. I'll have it. You know, I would rather run five days a week and put in really good efforts. And, and maybe some weeks I only get 70 or 80 K, but they're quality K they're all yeah. working towards improvement versus people that go out there and then they plot in 130, 140 K every week. But it's, it's exactly like I said, it's at the same pace and, and you never see an improvement. Yeah. Um, because you just you plateau at that pace yeah you can run for a while at that pace but you have no variance you're not challenging your body you're not pushing it yeah and, and for me that's where the big success lies yeah and you know the the way the saying goes how you train is how you perform right and yep. in an in an ultra too when you're in the mountains and stuff like that you're going to be given so many different types of terrain and, and elevations that your body is going to need to adapt if you're just used to running that same pace for hours and hours on end you're going to suffer through the other stuff right yeah you know yeah. definitely yeah definitely. yeah then and, and that's been kind of the philosophy i've always had and that's how we we looked at it you know in, in hockey was was tra train hard play easy yeah you know that that's what it's all about and that's it translates into ultras you train hard you race easy yeah um, and okay, we can say easy, but there's, there's no it's real relative. easy in ultra, yeah. um, but you just feel good out there. You, you feel better. You're not going to suffer as much. And then you'll have that competitive edge if yeah. you push yourself training. Yeah. That's crazy, man. Like, like you said, like it's been, so 2016, four years for you and you're, yeah. you're, you know, you're like, you're winning races and stuff. It's, I think, I mean, it, it's a testament to your training and the balance that you're doing right with everything that you have. So good stuff yeah, and, and no. natural ability too i mean you can't you can't take away from that either no you can't i mean there there has to be that little bit of natural ability but a lot of it ha comes down to you know your mental strength and your willpower and, and just getting up to put in those trainings you know it, it's yeah. not it's it's not fun to get up at 4 30 in the morning to go out for a track session you know come home get the kids ready for school take them to school and, yeah. and then go out and smash out 10k in the trails in, in Thailand when it's 35 degrees Celsius and, and 80% humidity, you know, that that's not fun to do that all the time. You know, it's fun to run, but yeah. just to make yourself do it. But once you get out there and get going and, and do it, then it's just like, wow. Yeah. For this sure. Is here. You yeah. Know? So it, it just, it just takes that discipline. Yeah. Hey, let me ask you, is your wife a runner as well? Um, she used to be so so we did a little bit of running um, together she doesn't do it as, as much anymore um, since okay. the kids and that. I think she might like to get back into it um, yeah. eventually but but nothing nothing to the level that I'm at um, yeah. probably more you, you know your 10 and 15k trail runs just to sure, get out sure. there yeah well we'll have to give her some kudos because I'm sure she gives you a lot of support to be able to to get your training and do what you're doing eh? oh definitely that that's yeah. the biggest thing that enables me to do what I do you know is is the wife and the kids accepting that I run these, these crazy mileages and then do the these training things and, and now you know run these running camps and, and workshops and stuff and then they're nothing but supportive of it yeah um, and 
it's so cool to have them at the race too. So that, that's one of the things I always try and do is, is get them up there at the race. And that they've been at the finish line when I've crossed for a few victories. That's and, so and cool. Like that. it, it's just a really cool moment as, as a family. Oh yeah, for sure. And you, you can't really beat that just to see the no. victory at the end after just going through what you just went through to see your loved ones. Yeah. There. So cool. No, it, Exactly, exactly. And, and that's some of my motivation during the race. If I have a low point or a low moment, it's, it's, and you consider quitting, it's like, do I want to show my kids that it's, it's okay when things get tough to yeah. sit down or to bow out? Or should I push through it and show them that perseverance is, is probably the best way? Now, it's, it's different if you're injured. You know, an injury that you need to treat differently. You don't sure. want to hurt your body anymore. But if it's just you're sore, you're not feeling good, your mind's playing tricks on you, well, then you need the little tricks to keep you going yeah now um have in your in your ultra running career so far up to date have you ever had any like injuries that have caused setbacks for you or just kind of little little niggles here and there yeah so so the only one that's really caused a, a major setback was the one in september was the, the, ankle. the sprained ankle yeah. so that that's the only race i've had to dnf because of a, a, a true valid injury um yeah. and it it you know, I thought it was going to set me back more than it did. I was questioning the UTMB, but recovery and everything else went really well. Um, and and there again, I think that plays into quality training, quality body mechanics, um, proper nutrition, proper mm -hmm. rest and recovery cycles. So you re avoid these, you know. An accident injury, you know, a slip, a sprained ankle, any of those things, is very different to a repetitive motion injury. Absolutely. And those are the ones that generally put a lot of runners, you know, off running. It's the shin splints. It's the yeah. knee problem. It's the hip problems. And those simply come from, from you know, too much, too soon. Yeah. Not proper form, not proper rest recovery cycles. So if you really watch that and manage that, then, you know, you can have a really long running career and you get faster. I'm, I'm getting older and getting faster every year. So, I, you know, I say bring on the next birthday. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, it is. that's great stuff, man. So let's talk a little bit about these kind of these uh, running camps that you're doing. So yesterday you had um, a trail runner, you and Eric and and another really good runner from Thailand. I can't remember his name right now. Yeah, Jay Jay, Jay. Jatrabon. Okay. So so yeah, go ahead. So sorry. So it was yesterday kind of the first first of a series of trail runs that you guys are putting together. Yeah, so so yesterday was really it was more of an ad hoc or kind of a, a proof of concept thing. Um, okay. So the com this company that I'm working with here in Thailand, it, it's a great company. They're called Trailway, and they're kind of a, they're a running, but they're a lifestyle. You know that they kind of promote the the trail lifestyle, and, and sure. just the the two owners run races. You know, Eddie and Matthias, they run races all the time. They just love to run, they love to race, and, and they love the lifestyle. So they make hats. Yeah. Um, sunglasses, a few gear, but now they're getting into more of the experience thing and try and get other people some trail running experience. But also we wanted to build in a little bit of, you know, technical training in these camps. Um, so, so they've, they've kind of partnered with Jay and, and Eric and, and myself to, to put on this run yesterday, which was just kind of a proof of concept run, you know, Jay was here and, and Jay is the top Thailand trail runner. So he's the top Thai trail runner. Awesome. Um, he's, he's, yeah, really, really amazing trail runner. Um, so we got him involved and then we just had this run yesterday. We did a coffee talk on Sunday, which was just kind of introducing who, who we are, you know, who is Jay, who is Eric, yeah. what is, what is kind of the concept all about, about what we're going to do and hopefully look to do and have some success in these camps. And then yesterday was just let, let's get out there with the running community that exists here in Phuket. Um, yeah. and go out and have a fun trail run so, so we awesome. ran a, a really nice trail um kind of in our backyard which is amazing as well yeah, know, yeah. ran the trail um would stop at a few sections and then do some explanation do some technical training you know how, how to run uphill properly how to run downhill properly how to use poles uphill how to use poles downhill when to and when not to do that nice um, and then that's really what these workshops are going to be they're going to be something where it's not just you go out and run with these runners and say hey i got to run with that guy but you take away something to improve your own running style that's great. So, th so these events then are open to anybody really from like a beginner who's wanting to learn about ultra to somebody who's, who's well-versed in it and wants to get a good workout. Like it's open to everybody. It sounds like. 
Yeah, and, and that's really what, what the target audience is. The target audience is someone who's never ran a trail run before. So not even an ultra. If you want to run a 15, 20K trail race, please come to this because you'll pick up everything. You know, we'll discuss what is mandatory gear. Why do I need this? What yeah. the heck is this? How does it work? You know, and, and those questions you first have when you get into it. But then for the, you know, seasoned experienced runners, there will be some stuff where you get to pick up technical tips and tricks from elite runners. You know, how do you guys run uphill so well and not get tired? How yeah. do you run downhill so fast and, and not feel like you're going to crash? Yeah. You know, why do you or why do you not use poles? You know, what is your nutrition, your hydration plans and, and those kind of things. And as we said, there, there's no secrets among us. So we're sharing everything we use in a race. Yeah, that's invaluable. And it's like, you know, I can, I can uh, give you, it's not really an analogy, but a, a comparison. So I played hockey growing up too, right? It was just house league, yeah. like, you know, Bush league hockey, whatever. But uh, I played summer hockey one year and it was all guys in, on rep teams that were just keeping yeah. in shape for the summer. And I'm playing with these guys. And uh, when I went back the next year to my house league, I was like leading scorer. Like a, my game just yep. elevated because I was with these guys that were so much better than me. Yep. And I, I must have just absorbed so much and, and elevated myself by being around them. So same thing's going to go with this running group, right? Like, yeah, people are exactly. just going to people are just going to elevate their game just by being there. Yep. No, exactly. And, and that's that's the hope of that. And then, then obviously now there'll be a, a camp sometime next year. And then, then the hope is to, to expand these and, and, you know, hopefully when in, international travel opens up, I would love to have people coming here on runcations. Absolutely. That would be, you cool know, business. because you, you know, you can come here, you can go for a run and, and then you can go to the beach in the afternoon. You know, it's not like we're on the trails all day. It's a three, four hour trail run. You yeah. have a quick debrief and, and then you get kind of the afternoon to do your own thing. That's pretty um, and, cool. and then there'll be some some worked in sessions as well where there's form specific stuff. So we'll either go to a track or, or go somewhere out on a flat road and Eric will run people through the form and everything else. So nice. it's, yeah, it's, it's, I'm really looking forward to it. I think it's going to be amazing for the, the running community here in, in Thailand and then hopefully further out in the world. Yeah, yeah. Where can the where can the local people in Thailand kind of find information on this? So it, it, like... it's all available on, on Facebook. So we're okay. doing everything kind of right now over social media um, sure. and, and more so, so Facebook. Um, so just get out there and, and check, you know, trailways, Facebook page or effortless running, everything gets posted on there or myself, Eric, um, cool. you can just follow us and then we're posting everything. And then once it, once it gets more finalized, obviously the signups and stuff, that'll be made a little bit more official. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds like a really exciting venture there, man. Yeah, it's yeah, it's, it's, gonna, it's, cool. it's, it's gonna be awesome. Yeah, Looking forward to. Yeah, so Mike, if I can ask you, I guess uh, I'd love to know. I'm sure our audience would love to know what are your must-haves during an ultra, like in terms of, I guess I don't know. Let's go with like gear, nutrition. What kind of shoes do you run in? Stuff like that. Like stuff you can't do a race without. Yeah. So, so for me, um, yeah, footwear is huge um, because when you run that distance, if you're not in a shoe, one, you feel comfortable with and two feels comfortable on your feet, mm -hmm. it sucks. It really sucks if you're getting blisters after 20K and you have 80 more to go, yeah. you, you know, it, it's not fun. Um, so, so I run in Scott running gear um, that they, they sponsor me, um, nice. but I, I, I run in their gear because I like it. You know, I wouldn't run for a company that I didn't enjoy their products and wasn't going to use their products. Yeah, that wouldn't um, make so any sense. It, it makes no sense to me to put yourself through something for something that, you know, you don't like. So that's what I run with. And, and the shoes are great. Their shoes are great. So I run in, in the Kinabalu Ultra RCs or the Super Track um, 2s, okay. which just depends on which race. One has a really aggressive lug and is built more for sky running and mud. And the other one's built more for speed and a little bit more cushioning. Um, so okay. it just depends on the race train and this and that. So I always have a, a mix and match of shoes. Um, and then aside from that, you know, gear is is gear. And I'm not really too fussy about the rest of that. You know, shorts and a shirt is shorts and a shirt. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, but shoes are the big one. And and then hydration and nutrition. That's, that's the biggest part of, of an ultra. Because generally when you hit a low moment in an ultra, it's either because you're not correctly hydrated or you're hungry. Yeah. Um, so yeah, hydration, nutrition. I use Unived products um, just because I found they work really well for me. Mm -hmm. And 
they pack easy. So their gels are about 30, I think 33, 33 to or 35 grams per serving their packages, but there's 190 calories in there. Pretty so, dense. So the, yeah. So the calorie to weight ratio is there and everything else in there is that I need. So they've got electrolytes, they've got everything else in there. Um, and they make a, a range of, of caffeinated ones as well, starting with, you know, your quick little shot at 25 milligrams of caffeine all the way up to your hundred milligrams. If, if you really need that, pick me up on the trail. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I use that. And generally if I'm running anything under 120 K, um, it's only gels and drink mixes. I don't do too much solid foods. Maybe if an aid station has some soup or some noodles or, you know, here in Thailand, rice soup is big. I really like yep. that because it's warm. It gives you a little bit of carbohydrates and it's generally pretty high in sodium. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it won't upset your stomach. Put some of that in and then fruit at aid stations. Um, but a real super must for me is, is some type of treat. Yeah. Now, when I was running in, in North America and, and doing some races in Canada, for me, it was always wine gums. Oh, yeah. I, I, would have, I would have a pack of wine gums in there. And that was just your little treat food when you were feeling that low moment or you just wanted something, you just pop it in and away you go. Yeah. Um, here, it's, it's generally gummy bears. The odd time I'll throw in, you know, a Snickers or a Mars bar. Yeah. Um, and it's just something different, just something to give you that little pickup. Yeah. And I guess because it's so chewy, it lasts a little bit longer than something you just like pound back real quick. Right? Yeah, exactly. And it, it just, it's very different consistency, very different taste than anything you've been putting in your mouth for, for the remainder. You know, when you just tired yeah. of putting a gel in there, it's great to have something else. Yeah, for sure. Oh, for sure. With that's you. And, and for me, that's really kind of my must. I'm not a really picky runner or not fussy um, over most things other than, than, you know, footwear and, and obviously your pack and everything else you have to have it has to be comfortable and you have to test it. Yeah. Um, but I think that's just something that you have to find out on your own. Okay. Now with your shoes, do you prefer to have more of a kind of a ground feel with less cushioning or do you like a little bit more cushioning on there for your feet? So does it depend I, on the race? I, yeah, I enjoy minimal running shoes. You know, I like to be able to feel the ground, especially when I'm running. You know, I like to run downhills pretty quickly as well. So yeah. you, you like to have that feel of the ground. Um, I find the shoes with more cushioning, the really high stacks, I feel like I don't have control. Okay. Or, or the control that I like to have. So it needs to be a balance. Obviously, I like to have enough cushioning that the bottoms of your feet aren't aching if you're running over rocks, you know, yeah. for an extended period of time. But I don't want too much cushioning that it feels like I've got pillows strapped to my feet because then you just don't feel that responsiveness that you need. Yeah. Um, for, for the technical races. And that's what I love to run. I love to run technical races, you know. Yeah. The nitty gritty down. stuff. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. you know, then you need to be more cushioned. If I was running some, probably some, you know, quicker, flatter races, then yeah, go, go for some more cushioning just to give yourself that extra, you know, speed that you can put on without feeling that impact in your body. Yeah. Do you, uh, do you like to use uh, rock plates for a little bit of extra? No, no you don't put them in there. Eh? No, for, I, I, it, I've had shoes with rock plates. I generally take them out. I like to have a little bit lighter shoe anyways. Um, yeah. and, and I like to feel the ground. So, so again, the, the rock plates, although they provide the protection, I, I feel I lose that connection. I love to have that connection with the ground. Yeah. Yeah. It's so important. I have, um, pair of ultra superiors that I have and they, they always come with rock plates. I've never used them, but I just got this yep. new here now. I'm like, oh, I'll put them in there and see what it's like. So, um, because we have a rail trail out here and it, it, yep. it'll go like up to Owen sound. It's pretty far. And, uh, there's, there are a few sections on there where I've gone without the rock plates and get these little sharp buggers. Eh? And they just, it's almost like stepping yeah. on, on a Lego. Eh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it, exactly. Yeah. So, so that's where you have to balance it. Right. Obviously, yeah. um, I don't have that that really sharp granite rock running that you have um, in, in Canada, yeah. um, here in, in Thailand. Um, and even when I was running, I hadn't ran races that had too much of that. So I was able to kind of push through that. But yeah. obviously if you're going to run in a bunch of that, then yeah, you might as well. I mean, it, it's run with what's comfortable for you. Yeah, exactly. That's what I figured. I figured I'd give them a try because I just kept throwing them out and I was like, ah, I'll use them, see what happens. So 
but now yeah, there's, awesome. there's snow everywhere. I don't need them at all. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, built in rock plates. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, Mike, uh, let me ask you, um, for 120 K, is that, has that been your farthest ultra that you've done so far? No. So the, the furthest ultra is 250. Okay. Um, 250, but those were stage races. Yeah. Um, and, and I guess the furthest single runs I've done is hundred miles. So, so I've d- done a couple hundred milers. Okay. That's pretty good. And what about, uh, some of your future, future running goals? What have you got in your crosshairs? Yeah. So, so right now I'm um, coming up in January, January 30th will be my first race of, of the season. That'll be another 120 K race, um, up in Northern Thailand called the West wind trail. And that one's generally pretty competitive again, um, brings a lot of the, the really good Thai runners there. Um, hopefully a lot of the, you know, local expats that are here will be there and then it'll be a good event. Um, that'll be the first event that I've ran. That's a point to point race. So that one's going to be really, really fun and interesting for me. So that you kind of picked up at the finish line, they drive you up to the starting line and, and then you run. So you run kind of point to point and no loops. Um, yeah. So, so for me, I'm, I'm really looking at that race as, you know, kind of the kickoff to the season. Let's have a good outing. Um, and, and then for me, it's, it's getting faster and, and faster. So, so I'm, I'm going to look and then probably target to be, you know, sub, sub 12, 11 hours in a hundred K race oh. in, in 2021. So that's, that's what I'm, I'm looking at getting for that. And then obviously I had a lot of races that were deferred or canceled in, in 2020. And I'm just mm-hmm. going to see what, what comes of those, you know, as, um, as I like to run technical races, there's a really big race in Indonesia called the Rinjani hundred and it, it runs up Mount Rinjani. It's, it's one of the toughest hundred K races, um, around. So it's 117 kilometers with, uh, 12,600 meters of elevation gain. Meters, not feet. Meters, <laughs> meters, <laughs> wow. not feet, not feet. So, so you're over 40,000 feet. Of, That's of insane. Of gain in 117k so you, you basically run up a, and around a, a volcanic mountain in indonesia so that was one of my target races last year so if that's back on this year then that's going to be a target and, and i want to go sub 24 hours in that oh wow are you going to do any um, kind of like altitude conditioning for that not too much no. um a, a little bit and then you know there's not a lot if i can't travel too much you know thailand doesn't have you know i think a thousand just a little over a thousand six hundred meters is kind of the tallest here so that doesn't really help you too much yeah yeah um so i, I won't do, won't do much of it for that but i think I've, I've been reading a lot and doing a lot of studying on the effects of heat training on your body yes um, and and although although it doesn't build the red blood cells that the altitude training does, it, it has a very simul- similar effect on your physical performance and, and your physique and, and just the way it stresses your body. So, so I think yes. it's, you know, as long as I'm not staying up there at extended periods of time, I'm, yeah, I'll go yeah. with it. Yeah, I've actually read that too. It's pretty interesting stuff. And uh, so yeah, you know, you're, you're in a good environment for that anyways. Exactly, exactly. So it's it's lunchtime runs and things like that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, forty degrees. Let's go outside for a run. <laughs> yeah, no, you know. exactly. So so that'll be kind of twenty twenty one. And um, Eric keeps trying to talk me into do a marathon. Um, so so let's let's see. I've, I've never done one before. Okay. So 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 let's see. I might might uh, venture into the road running side of things if I'm feeling comfortable and fast, and, and see if I can do a, a sub three hour marathon. Hey man, I always say, you know what, it's good to uh, get out of your comfort zone every once in a while and try something new, eh? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Just switch it up. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome, Mike. I really appreciate uh, this chat that we had, man. It's been really cool. Um, Just for our listeners, where can, where can people find you or reach out to you like on social media, email, what have you got? Yeah. So, yeah. So, so come and and find me on, I'm on uh, Instagram at uh, honey bad, honey, well, honey underscore badger um, one nine eight two. Okay. And Facebook, Michael McLean. Um, and just, yeah, look, look for the picture of the guy with the ribbon over his head. <laughs> <laughs> come, come find me there. Um, yeah, definitely. And then I, I love having people reach out to me. I'm free and available for anything. Um, talk trails, talk running, um, anything. That's, I, I just love to connect with people who share the same passions. Yeah, it's awesome. It's, it's, it's so great. And that's one of the things I love about podcasting is just being able to like, 
talk to great runners like you, like Eric, like people around the world, you know, you just kind of get connected. And, and I think people who run, we have so much in common, you know, even just beyond running, it's, it's pretty cool. Like, yeah, you can't beat it. No. And it, it adds so much value. I mean, that's how I kind of developed my, my ultra skills. Wasn't really talking to ultra runners. It was running the races and then going on YouTube and listening to podcasts, you know, that, yeah. that's, it, it's a really good way to, to get some insight into things. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we really appreciate the insight that you offered us today, Mike, and uh, best awesome. of luck. Have, Merry Christmas and best of luck yeah. in 2021, man. Yeah, you too. Merry Christmas. Have a good one. Yeah, man. We'll keep in touch for sure. For sure. Thanks. Oh, you know what? I got to I gotta leave you with our customer, customary saying, I almost forgot, and that is to run wild. Uh, definitely. <laughs> well, you can't run much more wild than when you're in the hot, sweaty jungle. <laughs> Absolutely. That's as wild as it gets, eh? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Take Cheers. it easy.